There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you to America's top museums to talk to the experts. Then we go behind the scenes to learn even more. We're in Stowe, Massachusetts, just west of Boston, at the American Heritage Museum, a world-class, interactive, educational museum sharing America's military and civilian history. There are actually three museums on the property, the American Heritage Museum, the Historic Aviation Hangar, and the classic Automobile Barn. Guests at the museum enjoy an immersive walk through the World War I trench experience, and they enjoy a cavernous display area of artifacts, tanks, and vehicles spanning World War II to present-day battlefields. The historic aviation hangar houses some of the world's most rare aircraft, including the early aviation collection, the World War II collection, the Korean War collection, and more aircraft that are currently being restored. Today we'll explore the collection of rare automobiles from the early period of automotive manufacturing. We'll learn more about our transportation history, and then we'll go behind the scenes for a ride in the historic M4 Sherman tank. So are you ready to explore transportation history and celebrate our national heritage? Let's go. So Hunter, we're here at the American Heritage Museum. We're about ready to go in. Give me an overview of what we can see here. We're going on a grand adventure. I'm ready. And so <laughs> we're going to go and see the beginnings of the Collings Foundation and what led to here at the American Heritage Museum. So we're gonna start in the classic car barn. See some beautiful classic cars. Yeah. And, and then from there, we'll go into the aircraft hangar, historic aircraft hangar. That's what started our whole aviation part to the foundation. And then from there, we transition here to the American Heritage Museum, to where we have not only some very rare historic aircraft, but also some very rare tanks and armored vehicles. It follows that same uh, mantra we have with the Wings of Freedom tour. If you read history, if you listen to history in a classroom setting, mm -hmm. something you might remember to experience something from history, you never forget it. Like flying in a World War II aircraft, driving in a World War II tank has that same type of, of interaction mm -hmm. with the history. So once we get through these fantastic collection, then we'll go for a drive. I'm ready. Okay, ready. let's go. Good, <laughs> sounds good. So Hunter, where are we here? This, this amazing place is where it all started. So in, in this section of the Collings Foundation, the American Heritage Museum, we have some very rare beautiful, extraordinarily rare American classic automobiles. Starts as early as the early 1900s with the 1904 Franklin, the Cadillacs, and then we get into the classic era. We have one of Fred Dusenberg's Dusenbergs here, oh. a 1927 Rolls Royce, uh, a Packards and Cords, um, a really nice round representation of the quintessential cars of the classic era. Now, these were obviously earlier cars, and I know uh, Massachusetts was kind of paving the way, weren't they, in manufacturing also? They were. It's fascinating, too, to think about this. So in, in the early 1900s, just in the state of Massachusetts alone, 
there were over 200 individual independent car manufacturers. Really? Yeah, all making their own version of the best machine, the best car. What's so neat is not only are these cars really beautiful to look at, mm. but most of them are in running condition. And that is unbelievable. It, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's one thing to see a classic car like this in a static setting, like mm -hmm. what we have here on display. But a couple times through the year, we pull them out and we do these really fun living history events around this type of activity. And it's really fun to see them out running around. Oh, I bet and it is. People get all dressed up and, and we do some fun activities that highlight the era that these cars came from. And the cars themselves, of course, they need to be run every now mm -hmm. and then to keep them up in, in running condition. The, the, the best part to it really is, you know, we're known for, you know, having and operating one of the world's largest collections of historic aircraft that mm -hmm. you had seen there, you know, Wings of Freedom Tour, and now the American Heritage Museum. But the classic car collection, this is where we came from. Yeah. And a lot of our turn of the century educational programming was around the operation of these classic cars. And so this is, this is where it all began. Most cars at this time, we're talking about the early 1900s, mm -hmm. they were still considered a, a real niche thing. Uh, sure. So much more- Niche as, for the rich, was yeah, it? Niche or, for the rich, yeah, yeah sure. absolutely. Yeah. So they were really considered novelties. Um, they, most people felt that cars were um, were not as dependable as your local horse. Oh, interesting. So yeah. there was a lot of contention back then. Sure. And, and you know, testament to that are, are strange laws that came up, like in Pennsylvania, which was a red flag law that meant anyone who operated these early contraptions, should they encounter any livestock or pedestrians, had to wave a flag or a lantern to alert that pedestrian or livestock of the oncoming machine. Really? And oh my gosh. And even in, in uh, England, it, it was law. You had to do that. And, and it illustrates the contention between the, the traditionalists mm -hmm. who were really believed in the horse and then the people who thought, no, automobiles are the future. And what do you think are the highlights here? There's, there's so many that are just beautiful to look at. But my favorites, of course, is the, the 1927 Rolls-Royce. Mm -hmm. Quintessentially the classic designed car, the height of the Art Deco era. And my other favorite car is the 32 Duesenberg. This was one of the Duesenberg's brothers' test vehicle. So oh. this one specific vehicle was used by Fred Duesenberg to test his new engine. It was considered uh, a, a really, really deluxe supercar of the time. And uh, think of it as like a, a multi-million dollar Lamborghini or Ferrari of our time. That's what this car represented back in 1932. And there's other cars too that are unique. The, the single cylinder Oldsmobile is our earliest car. Fantastic illustration of early automobile technologies. All the way up to our Stanley Steamer, which is our car, the hybrid car that mm, runs okay. on... on of water and kerosene. For me personally, the classics take the take the show. They're just gorgeous to look at. Oh, they're they're like pieces of sculpture. They are. They're kinetic sculpture. Absolutely. When would the common man be able to start to afford a car, and which car would that be? Well, it it would really come with the Model T. Model T. Yeah. yeah. Although in in the early 1900s, uh, Ford they were the first to really mass produce automobiles. Prior to that, each car was manufactured uh, on, a, on a really a individual basis. They, there wasn't wow. an assembly line yeah. like they had with what Henry Ford came up with. 
So it really was Ford and his assembly line, his ability to mass produce these sure. automobiles that then made them more accessible to the general public. And that is what really transitioned our country uh, and economies towards the automobile, specifically automobiles powered by petrol. I almost feel like I need to put on sunglasses with all the shine coming off of these. Yeah. <laughs> And the, they're just beautiful. Oh. Even the hood ornaments themselves are real pieces oh. of art. They're beautiful. Yeah, the Chrysler CG Imperial. Oh. And of course, the 32 Duesenberg SJ. This is this is one of our fanciest it's vehicles. It's stunning. Here. And then the 1927 Rolls. Again, you know, really just beautiful cars. Now, would they, when these were being tested or when they were originally coming out, were they this blinged out or no? They did. They look very similar to what you see here. Oh. Of course, they were all uh, meticulously restored at one part of their lives or another. So, I see. Um, they, they look very reminiscent of their original paint schemes. I see. Yeah. And talk to me about these tires. These white walls are gorgeous in the spokes. Yeah, tire production back then, um, there were only a, a very few tire manufacturers that could really make tires that could withstand the forces that a car like this would produce. You have to keep in mind that Fred Duesenberg, this was his own personal test vehicle for this special engine that he had in there. Wow. It was very powerful. Uh, it, it really um, produced a lot of power. Only a small handful of cars could go over 100 miles an hour in the 1930s. Wow. Fred Duesenberg uh, really advanced the engine technologies, as did Rolls-Royce. Mm -hmm. And you might know that like Rolls-Royce with the Packard built Merlins and the Merlin engines, mm -hmm. Those then later went into aircraft like the P-51 Mustang, which we have really? two that we operate. Yeah. So Rolls-Royce was very synonymous with engine development and that we're, we're seeing later and played a really vital, important role as we got into World War II. One of my favorite hood ornaments in all of these vehicles is on the Rolls-Royce. Elegant and beautiful but also adventurous yeah. and free. Yeah. And that Those really, wings. it captures all of that in a, in a, in a really nice uh, hood ornament. And so a lot of people recognize Rolls Royces just from that. From the hood know. ornament, wow. This is the one of very few that remained that was actually built in Springfield, Massachusetts. Oh, wow. So <laughs> Rolls Royce, at first they would send the chassis over to the United States and we would basically assemble them. But we, and, and they would send their own mechanics and manufacturers sure. over uh, to oversee that. Yeah. But it quickly transitioned to the point where the United States were making the cars basically from, completely. Yeah, yeah. From all the way up from scratch. Um, yeah. And this is a very special, it has a a uh, dual cal phaeton design to it, but it's it's very special to this particular model mm -hmm. of Rolls Royce. And you know, again, all of these uh, cars they were very custom, and so those who had the money, this is very much of a status symbol for a lot of people of the time. And it's important to note too that. 1927 into the 30s, we're, we're in the height of the depression. Yeah. So this is a real clear indication of the haves and have nots, yeah, you know, when yeah. you go rolling down the street and something yeah. like this. <laughs> yeah. So obviously the collection continues. Where are we here, Hunter? We're in the historic aircraft hangar. So as we transition from the exhibition of early classic beautiful cars, mm -hmm. then we start getting into aviation as a means to tell the stories, to, to engage people in the history. So this hangar 
was built. And here we started the manufacture or the restoration mm. of the B-24 Liberator. Oh, wow. So in the hangar, not only do we have some really neat vintage sprint and midget race cars, early Indianapolis race cars, but the aircraft collection is astounding. It's just amazing. Now you're starting with flying machines and going all the way to where? Yeah, so the we start in the very heyday of aviation. We have representation of the, the Wright Brothers EX aircraft, which is one of the very few replicas we have in the collection. That same type of aircraft was the first that made a, a successful transverse across the United States. Okay. We also have a uh, 1914 Model F flying boat, which is a, made by Curtis. Also a 1911 Curtis pusher. Um, most of it is original and it was restored to its original condition. It looks absolutely stellar. They, mm. they look brand new. And we work our way up the timeline into World War II, where we have some World War II aircraft like the Stearmans, T-6 Texan. These were trainer aircraft in mm -hmm. World War II, all the way up to the largest carrier-based aircraft of World War II, which is a TBM Avenger and everything in between. And so as far as the Collings Foundation and our, our aviation part to our programs, this is where it started. Behind the scenes, adjacent to the hangar, the restoration and maintenance shops at the Collings Foundation are always active. Experts ranging from tank repair to classic car restoration always have something interesting to work on. We were lucky enough to see car maintenance expert Chris Cassidy working on Chicago gangster Al Capone's Cadillac the day we were there. So Hunter, this space is worth is worth the wait. It is so dramatic. It's incredible. This is, of course, I'm a little biased, but this collection of armor is truly unique. Many one of a kind pieces, uh, and it's it, it, what's so beautiful is that they're they're perfectly restored. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are actually in running condition. So we start, of course, in, in World War I with our tank collection, and it goes all the way up to the only civilian displayed M1A1 Abrams in the world, and everything in between. Of course, out on, on the main floor on the right side is World War II Europe, goes into the Pacific Theater, Korea, Vietnam, Cold War, War on Terror, all the way up to current time. And uh, yeah, there's a lot to see. You know, and as I was walking through earlier, the designs, you can see that the designs are modified as they move along. Right. And it looks like some were even, could be on land or maybe in water or... Yeah, that's like right. combinations. It's right. So we have several amphibious vehicles here. The Schwimmwagen that the Germans had was this little car that could go on to small, you know, rivers and lakes to transverse those lakes. We have an LVTA-4 which the Marines used. This is the one that's only, uh, the only one on public display in North America. So that's another amphibious vehicle. And what's, what's wonderful about this particular collection is it's Russian tanks, it's American tanks, it's Japanese tanks, um, and everything in between. So the representation of World War I to World War II up to current time we really cover all the bases yeah, with the artifacts do. that are in the museum. Well, so ta let's talk about the mechanics of it, the engines that are in it. Are any of these engines similar to what would have been used in aircraft or even earlier in cars? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of that technology, like the, the, the cars that we talked about in the classic car collection. So we talked about Rolls-Royce making aircraft engines like the Merlin mm -hmm. engine, um, Cadillac, Buick, uh, Ford, all of these companies, as soon as World War II came around, they used the engine technologies in manufacturing their cars for civilian use, mm -hmm. and they changed that to make aircraft engines, like the case of Buick, 
for B24 liberators, for consolidated. So a lot of the, that technology was used directly into the war effort during World War II. So there's a war effort. These factories are converting, mm. but the young men are all fighting the war. Is this where Rosie the Riveter comes in? That's right. Were, were there women manning the factories? This is the first <laughs> time, right, first time in American history, really, that women, a lot of minorities, actually took the place of young men um, as they went off to war. Once World War II came around, the industrial infrastructure in the United States completely changed, flipped entirely upside down, whereas Prior to that, we were manufacturing for the general populace for their consumer goods sure. and their, their family cars. During World War II, all of that stopped. And that's when it transitioned into the war effort. So everything from Steinway to Ford to Buick, all of these companies then started manufacturing things um, to help the soldiers. Well, let's go down and take a little closer look. I'm, I'm itching to get a close up. Great. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to see. There sure is. Yeah, come right. with me. Okay. The American Heritage Museum features the totally immersive World War I trench experience. This one-of-a-kind exhibit puts you in the trenches of the battle-torn landscape of St. Mihiel, France, during a major clash on the Western Front in 1918. The attack at St. Mihiel was the first offensive launched primarily by the U.S. Army. World War I was one of the deadliest conflicts in history. It was a significant turning point in the political, cultural, economic, and social climate of the world. So we're down on the main floor now. Tell, tell me what we're right. looking at here. Honey. Right, so we're on the European side of the museum. Okay. Uh, so this is European theater. Uh, and so you're seeing, again, representation of the British tanks, the American tanks, Russian and German. Uh, this is M22 Locus. This is a, a British made, the light tank. You can kind of tell by the size of it. Yeah. Uh, but U.S. Uh, markings? In U.S. markings, huh. right. Huh. Yep. So bro both the Brits and the Americans use this tank. Um, and then we go to Battle of the Bulge with a Jumbo Sherman tank. As we go into crossing the Rhine, there'll be tanks like the M18 Hellcat and the Comet. Um, and then in the defense of the Reich, when we talk about the last stand of the Germans, you know, during mm -hmm. World War II, mm -hmm. we have an ME109, which is a very rare German fighter aircraft. And, and even um, in that same exhibit, we have an IS-2, which is a Russian tank, also very rare, the only one in North America. Wow. And it's neat. So when you go into each each exhibit area, when, for instance, in Battle of the Bulge, mm -hmm. there's effects and accessories that go along with the tanks that really help put that tank into that era, into yeah. that history. Well, it's immersive, and, as we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we've been to a lot of museums on Museum Access, but collections like this must require specific maintenance I mean, restoration, of course, but what about maintenance? They do. The maintenance and restoration, uh, of course, is it's a very finite thing. Um, we're very particular when it comes to how each vehicle is restored and presented. Mm. The objective is to make each artifact as close to the original artifact as we can get it. Yeah. So um, it takes a lot of preparation a lot of custom machining and maintenance. So you have to realize that a lot of the tanks, the vehicles in this museum are actually in running condition. Wow, that's so unusual. It is, yeah. it is. And same thing with, you remember we were talking about the classic cars, mm -hmm. seeing one on, on a static display versus one out in the sunshine, same thing for a tank. Sure. So have a tank here in a, in the museum setting that's pretty neat, but to see one running, it takes on a whole different personality. And so we have a group of very talented and seasoned um, professionals who help us maintain the collection 
and to keep a lot of these vehicles running, mm. to actually keep them up to running status because we offer actual tank rides and driving experiences some in some of the tanks. And I think that we have a tank lined up for you <laughs> to drive in, <laughs> which is really exciting. I can't and just stand by it. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm getting in. It's, it, but it's these experiences that really bring you closer, not only as a sense of appreciation of what these young men were going through, but it's an experience you'll never forget. Well, I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, and you'll meet up with our driver. And uh, yes. I'm ready. Great. Good. <laughs> good. So first of all, I'm assuming this is this is the right garb for tanks, right? Just oh, yeah. the guys wear. You look totally awesome yeah, in the tank. Yeah, you wouldn't sure. stand out at all. Oh, you wouldn't be a newbie at yeah, all. Yeah, You'd right. blend right in. Right. What can I say? I couldn't find camouflage. That's okay. Tell me about this Sherman tank. Well, it's a 19, 1944 A3-4. Has a Ford, has a Ford V8 in it. Yes. And how many crew members would be? There'd be five. There'd be five. a commander. Okay. There'd be a gunner. There'd be a loader. It'd be a driver in the left front and like a co-driver on the right front. Well, I'm sure we don't like jump up here, so no, how do we get in here? It's an adult, it's an adult jungle gym. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. All right. Well, let's do it. Now it's my turn to get behind the wheel, or should I say the throttles? Everybody take cover. The M4 Sherman tank was used throughout World War II and into the Korean War. It was a strong, reliable tank on the battlefield that was used in all theaters of operation. To this day, it remains a symbol of the liberation of Europe. The tank at the American Heritage Museum is also a movie star. It was featured in the 1982 movie Tank, starring James Gardner. Transportation technology is an important part of American history. We salute the early pioneers in the automobile and aviation industries, from battlefields to backcountry roads. We all enjoy the fruits of their labor. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time.